Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our
the special congress because usually we have the FAPA congress every two years. So last year we had it in Malaysia. And this year it will be in uh, Taipei at the Taipei International Convention Center or TICC. So I think Dr. Faraz has uh, joined again the meeting. And um, just a couple of reminders to those interested to submit their abstracts. The deadline is actually coming this July 31st. And for those who are interested to be um, to participate as a registrant, so the early bird registration closes on August 31. So it's a good opportunity for us to network and meet again in Taipei. And there are packages that are available for further discounts. So there is a 10% discount if there will be um, group registration for 20 participants and above. So you already have the early bird rate and the... Oh, they're back. So welcome back, Dr. Faraz. So for more information about the FAPA Congress, just visit the website, fapa2023.com. So that's fapa2023.com, or you can scan the QR codes or screenshot this slide. Can you see the presentation now, Christine? Hi, Dr. Faraz. Can you restart sharing the presentation again? Thank you. Can you see it now, Christine? Yes, we can see your screen. Thank you. Okay, resume. Uh, as I mentioned, that uh, the whole sum of all the components. Uh, can you can you listen, please? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Thank you, Sir Sohail. Okay. All the components of of uh, the therapeutic goods. Uh, it includes the pharmaceutical, biologicals, medical devices, cosmetics, and health health and OTC products. These are uh, all uh, under regulatory framework and collectively uh, they are known as uh, therapeutic goods. Okay. As far as the pharmaceuticals are concerned, pharmaceutical is uh, uh, with a three, 350 importers and uh, 650 local manufacturers. It is a market of 655 billions of rupees uh, of Pakistan and main uh, competitors uh, in the region are India, Bangladesh, China, and uh, our total registered products uh, in pharmaceuticals only that are above 90,000. And uh, main exports countries of Pakistan are Sri Lanka, Nepal, Afghanistan, Maldives, Indonesia, and Philippines. As I mentioned that uh, some of the components uh, where the health sector rest with the, in, in, with the federation and uh, others are with the provinces. And uh, Pakistan is a 239 million population country uh, where Punjab uh, has a significant uh, population that is approximate 50%, 116 million, and uh, rest of the provinces are Sindh, KP, Blochistan, uh, ICT, GB, and Azad Jammu Kashmir. Uh, they have uh, uh, their 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 uh, number, but but Punjab uh, is with the 50%. As I mentioned that. Uh, Next slides, I'll be focusing more on the Punjab uh, overall health sector and its regulatory framework. And uh, at the end, in particular, the pharmacovigilance setups we have now uh, as compared to the, in the last uh, 10 to 20 years. 
as far as the health sector is concerned the, the punjab province uh, is a bifurcated with primary and secondary and tertiary uh, health sector department in primary sector we deals with the basic health units uh, and uh, rhc that is a rural health centers maternity hospitals mobile health units we have trauma centers and dispensaries in secondary uh, healthcare setups we have uh, are relatively a bigger facilities where uh, where significant number of uh, each uh, specialties are are operating with these are at the district level we have a 36 districts across punjab and uh, at tehsil level as well we have approximate 131 tehsil headquarter hospital as well in tertiary care hospitals we have uh, facilities where where the, all these specialties uh, gynae peds ortho medical surgical neuro I mean, all the facilities uh, we we offer services, and these two uh, sectors, where primary and secondary uh, department is governing all the secondary healthcare facilities and uh, basic facilities, whereas a dedicated department that is specialized healthcare and medical education department dealing with all the tertiary care hospitals, including the teaching uh, medical teaching institutes as well. These are the stats where the primary sector uh, is operating and, and the, the below side, the secondary health facilities, as I mentioned, 26 uh, district level hospitals and 131 are the TSE level uh, health facilities. Now the average bed strength against uh, each of the TSE level hospitals and uh, average population ser 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 service, there's a 1 million and population type 91% of uh, the rural and 9% are the urban area. The specialties uh, in each of the the seal level facilities are the physicians, gynecologists, pediatricians, cardiologists, anesthetists, orthopedic pathologists, surgeons, and uh, in the last but not the least, the pharmacy services. In our district level health facilities, the average bed strength is a 200 plus, uh, where one to three million population catering and population type of 72 percent rural and 28 percent urban again uh, in the district level uh, we have uh, some of the improved version of uh, specialties we serve including derma and pulmonologist radiologist physiotherapist and pharmacy services of course uh, are the uh, are the main where where we are offering in our tertiary care health facilities, we have medical institutions and in terms of web MBBS uh, degree, 21 medical and dental colleges, nursing schools, and 51 hospitals, and including the one uh, which are attached with these uh, medical and dental colleges. Approximate number of HRs, more than 10,000 doctors, nurses are 16,000 in number, and 11,000 allied health profession professionals and 9,000 PG trainings. Bed strength uh, to this extent are approximate uh, 30,000. And the service delivery output, these includes the emergency services and uh, outdoor services, and more than 50,000 uh, patients attend uh, all these uh, uh, teaching health facilities you know, per day, and in our outdoor, more than 70,000. Budgets. 300 billion uh, we spend in our uh, health sector. These include uh, the one uh, which are on the regular side, I mean, uh, as a recurring expenditure of the health facilities and uh, the one, 151 that are at the, at the development side, where uh, the continuous expansion and uh, upgradation of these health facilities are catered with the, this development side. Now, drug control. Drug control in Pakistan is a highly regulated subject. As I mentioned, collectively, all these are known as uh, therapeutic goods. 
pharmaceuticals are uh, the one which are highly regulated second secondly the biologicals and and then the medical devices and uh, health and notice including the cosmetics are in the in the progressive phase in drap uh, uh, is is, is uh, administering its uh, all functions through a dedicated act that is a drug regulatory authority of pakistan act 2012 in this act various kinds of functions including the pharmaceutical evaluation registration drug licensing quality assurance medical device and cosmetics biological drugs control drugs pharmacy services health and otc pricing budget administration and hr and the legal affairs like etc all these are functions are administering through this uh, statutory provisions in the country now uh, the drap uh, is continuously uh, is improving its functions and uh, and striving hard uh, to to get the position at par at the international level in somewhere 2018 19 uh, we, uh, we we sort out our targets that uh, we need to be assess our structure in order to uh, park at at some of the international accreditations and subsequent to this uh, planning who recommendation visit self assessment in 2020 then 2021 submission of uh, gbt and verification report somewhere in 2020 2022 now in the recent past uh, we had a very uh, very much healthy assessment by who uh, where they have uh, Uh, they have declared uh, the uh, drap in some of the areas whereas in some uh, some of the areas we are lacking but in the near future uh, i hope uh, that our national regulatory setup uh, will be in compliant in the international level and will will be accredited with the international lines this is the structural organogram of uh, drap where the body is governed by by the federal federal government uh, through its ministry of national health service and regulation and then the policy board is the is the is the governing board where all the policy decisions uh, take place and through its chief executive uh, all these policy decisions its regulations are being are being exercised and uh, a very well and uh, vibrant structures of various divisions including the pharmaceuticals drug licensing uh, biologicals health and otc and and various other divisions uh, are, are are in function as i mentioned uh, earlier that uh, the drug regulation and other uh, other uh, areas in pakistan is a shared responsibility between the two the federation and the provinces some of the functions in drug regulations are rest with the federation these include the manufacturing license of uh, the the manufacturing sites i mean uh, before going uh, allotting them the market authorization registration of the product import export pricing and advertisement all these uh, areas are rest with the federation and uh, where the provinces uh, are liable to operate is the two main areas the quality control this is the primarily of post market authorization and uh, batch release uh, subsequent as a active surveillance in the market and and drug sale licenses to regulate all the sale points including the ones uh, where uh, where the community pharmacy service serving is there and distribution setups or all the licenses are rest with the provinces these are the statutory provisions drap act and drug act initially it was the drug act 1976 uh, which was governing all the aspects uh, of the pharmaceuticals but later on 2012 uh, as i mentioned the term of therapeutic good where the term therapeutic good uh, was introduced these includes uh, all the pharmaceuticals biological medical devices cosmetics and health and otc products 
the provincial regulatory structure uh, is is governed by by a dedicated office that is a directorate of drug control punjab i am holding this office currently from the last uh, one and a half year and these include uh, its various wings to discharge its uh, the two main functions quality control and sales uh, through its field formations which are the sole regulator in uh, in the field the testing laboratories uh, for any kind of uh, active and uh, and, and uh, other areas of surveillance and uh, the drug testing laboratories the the area where i think the pakistan uh, can be a single out uh, in the region uh, as i mentioned in some of the areas pakistan is really uh, facing challenging uh, but in areas where we have now progressed so so much and 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 in the region we are now at a single out this is a drug testing laboratory especially punjab but pakistan of course as a, as a national uh, program all the field formation and drug testing laboratories uh, activities are always report to any of the an experts board that is a quality control board where we have a representation of uh, medical pharmaceuticals and some of the government functionaries none of the any none of the any action initiated by any of the office of the drug regulatory side uh, can be proceed further without any of the scientific uh, deliberation and and due thought process where the provincial quality control board in in each of the province is empowered to pass its judgment and in the last pharmacy services and pharmacovigilance this is the area uh, which is very close to my heart and uh, always focus that though we we have a very robust uh, analytical quality control and field formation field regulators but the area we need to spend we need to focus we need to have a hard work that is the this the this is the pharmacy and pharmacovigilance setup this is the provincial organogram of uh, directorate of drug control as i mentioned that uh, all the regulatory sites are being governed by by a dedicated wing in in the directorate as a field formation through chief drug controller provincial quality control board is also the forum where uh, regulating the drug testing laboratories pharmacy and pharmacovigilance services we have dedicated in this directorate where a dedicated officer of director pharmacy services is governing all the sites in the health facilities and the functions there is a registration of cosmetics and licensing cosmetics uh, i think this is the the most uh, important site in the future uh, where we are now in progress uh, because uh, in 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 a society uh, we are facing a very much uh, a hard uh, music in terms of a cosmetics where the huge number of uh, a counterfeit and some of the some substandard cosmetics have been emerging in the market and the the government has decided to regulate this area as well as the the formulation as the as the products are more uh, in resemblance in terms of a quality control uh, to the drug so uh, we are now planning to incorporate into its uh, drug uh, regulatory structure uh, where we will be uh, enabling Uh, to to regulate this area in our uh, regulatory structure all uh, some of the some of our uh, our offenses are are of uh, having a criminal status uh, in our statutory setup so we have a dedicated uh, legal wing as well uh, to proceed any of the matter in for the court of law now field formation uh, field formation is being governed uh by a dedicated office there is a chief drug controller in in each of the province in punjab uh, the chief drug controller is uh, supervising uh, the two main functions it is it is the sole uh, provincial licensing authority who is liable to grant license of all the field uh, drug sale licenses these includes the distributions and uh, pharmacies as well secondly as a as a head of the field formation Uh, it's being uh, one of the main responsibility 
is being monitoring surveillance and enforcement of laws and policies. So through these two uh, main uh, operations, chief drug controller is the head of field formation. These are the stats uh, of Punjab, but uh, as I mentioned, this is the overall 50% of uh, Pakistan. We have a total number of uh, point of sales, more than 33,000. These includes uh, the distributors having, uh, having authorization from the manufacturer or importer uh, to supply the products at the point of sales. Uh, more than 3,000 distributors and pharmacies are approximate more than uh, 12,000 in numbers. The, in the last, the medical stores, these are the outlets which are in different uh, of uh, pharmacies. That medical stores are the outlets who are liable uh, to, to sold only of the products uh, that are excluded of one of the schedule. That is a schedule G in our regulations. And this schedule G is describing uh, the therapeutic drugs, including the biological steroids and uh, some of the hypertensive antibiotics and uh, some other antivirals, steroids, etc. All these are uh, fall in the schedule G and medical stores uh, are not supposed to uh, have all these products in their outlet. If where the medical stores are uh, or all the medical stores are being governed by by assistant pharmacist. Whereas a qualified degree holders, pharmacies are guard with the, with the qualified persons of pharmacist. Our drug testing laboratories. We have six in number in Punjab. These are uh, in the two in the Lahore district and uh, rest of the four are in Multan, Faisalabad, Rawalpindi and Bahawalpur. As I mentioned, uh, all these units the area of testing, drug testing is our pride, not only in the region, but uh, I'll show you in the next slides that uh, in the world as well. These are our uh, international collaborators where we intervene in our drug testing setups. LGC UK, United States Pharmacopoeia, Turkish uh, Ministry of Health and uh, PQM. And of course, our own uh, regulatory body that is a drug regulatory authority of Pakistan, Pakistan National Accredited Council and government of Punjab. What we did in our uh, drug testing laboratories uh, in last uh, seven to eight years. Uh, of course, this idea came uh, into mind through some of the incidences happened in uh, in Punjab uh, where we we plan to revamp whole of our drug testing uh, laboratory structures in 2016. These includes all the uh, replacement of HR, paradigm shift of the index operation from conventional to quality management system and compendial analysis. And our ultimate target was to get any of the international accreditations, the one which is uh, the most uh, having a credible level at moment. The journey started in somewhere 2016. Pakistan Drug Testing and Research Center, uh, though, started its journey in somewhere 2014 and achieved this milestone in 2016. And rest of the four units uh, achieve uh, the target in somewhere 2018 in approximate 24 months or less. Now, our uh, five drug testing setups uh, are, sorry, all six drug, drug testing setups are. Uh, ISO 17025 uh, module compliant and uh, we are continuously in 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 engage with the Pakistan National Accredited Council to continue monitoring this compliance level. Next target was uh, to 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 get the WHO pre qualification uh, accreditation uh, status again Pakistan Drug Testing and Research Center. Uh, which planned earlier in somewhere 2015 and uh, achieved the same at uh, in 2017 and the rest of uh, the
Before we lost the audio again. Dr. Faraz, can you share again from Madam Garing? By stable with three both are Hello. We can hear you. Can you hear us now? Yes. Can you presentation again? Thank you. Okay. In terms of these uh, uh, drug testing labs. We have uh, uh, now five units in, in Pakistan, which are WHO accredited and uh, with these number, uh, not only in the region, but uh, in overall in the world, uh, we have the maximum number of WHO pre-qualify accreditations in our structure. And uh, this doesn't mean only the accreditation or set a single piece of paper as a certification, but uh, these includes all its operations, quality management system, and uh, its uh, its uh, analysis, which is a pure compendial and official analysis uh, across uh, its operation. These are the world stats uh, where WHOP qualify units uh, currently are being operated. Total 53 in number, and maximum maximum number of WHOP qualify labs in a single country that is a Pakistan. We have five. India has four, Ukraine, Brazil collectively have three and uh, two units uh, in Pakistan that were one is rest with the uh, Drug Regulatory Authority of Pakistan that is CDL Karachi and one again in, in, in our province that is Drug Testing Laboratory Bhawalpur. Uh, both are waiting for the final assessment from WHO team. These are the stats or burden or, or the number where these drug testing laboratories are being uh, operated. Uh, more than 37,000 analyses in, uh, in one uh, year, that is July 2022 to June 2023. And this number, uh, I, 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 I presume that uh, even more than the total number of drug analysis conducted by whole Europe even uh, in a year. And these uh, Includes the 36,000 and more than 36,000 as of standard quality and uh, 1,000 plus approximate as a field uh, out of specification. These include field uh, samples of more than 500 and uh, public procurement of more than 800. Now, next are the quality control board. As I mentioned, that uh, none of uh, the action of the either by the field formation as a as a field surveillance and uh, the provincial and the provincial drug testing laboratories can proceed further without any uh, a scientific deliberation. And this deliberation is always conducted at a forum that is a provincial quality control board. This is a Kasai judicial body. Again, this uh, setup is also ISO accredited. Now, last uh, is the pharmacy services and pharmacovigilance. And the role of pharmacies there. We have total of approximate 1500 pharmacies serving in our uh, regulatory setups, including the ones in drug testing laboratories, a field regulator as a part of uh, chief drug controller or field formation, and the more 100, uh, 500 plus number uh, are served various health facilities, primary, secondary health care. And uh, one of the key service structure or key each are health facilities either at the end of a secondary, primary and secondary or at the level of a tertiary having a pharmacy manager dedicated position.
the power of inspector of drug uh, liable uh, to take any of the action including the seizure not to dispose of or uh, sampling for quality analysis this pharmacovigilance uh, setup is uh, is being uh, backed up backed up by by a statutory provisions uh, in the laws i mentioned earlier drab 2012 and drug act where uh, the, all these designated national pharmacovigilance centers and all its staff uh, are are having under the statutory framework spontaneous reporting flow is one of the key feature of this structure national adverse drug reaction reporting and dat database and then communication strategy again in comparison uh, with the region uh, where the south east asia, east asia western specific eastern mediterranean and eastern mediterranean both uh, turkey and pakistan we have some of the on the comparison stats where all these uh, countries initiated their pharmacovigilance setups and including the pakistan uh, where we we had our our national pharmacovigilance center in somewhere early 90s but that was not uh, so vibrant and we may call that uh, as a redundant setup so we uh, we were lacking in our uh, infrastructure and the statutory backing uh, but we had the that time uh, our pharmacovigilance setups in india it was initiated somewhere in 80s with uh, 250 adr reporting centers china uh, somewhere in 90s uh, late 90s with 34 provincial and more than 300 regional centers with its china adverse drug reaction monitoring system and uh, turkey relatively has a, a more a robust system of uh, not only with the regions but have uh, electronic setups of uh, drug detection uh, reporting and uh, some of our electronic system where they all the therapeutic goods uh, are being monitored through a, a single software uh, the same uh, is being used for any kind of a recall or not to dispose of uh, activities in terms of a budget uh, in the pharmacovigilance uh, again uh, in china 1.5 billion uh, jan and 15 million by turkish uh, uh, authorities and uh, more than 300 million uh, by the indian authorities and again uh, as overall health sector we are lacking in the, in the same area in the area as well we are we are spending a uh, too less money in our pharmacovigilance setup so uh, what are the what were the incidences which instigated us uh, earlier in 2000 12 uh, onward that uh, we had a very much a bad experience of uh, some of the horrible incidences took place in our health facilities where one of the manufacturer uh, supplied a drug that is a ssr by dinitrate mononitrate sorry but uh, the formulation was contaminated in one of the anti malarial that is pyrimethamine and uh, due to this uh, this this incidence we lost hundreds of patients uh, life and this is no even uh, mentioned in in international national uh, adverse reaction books uh, this is this was the uh, the horrible incidents in our society uh, even in the history of pakistan second one again in 2012 or 13 uh, we were having uh, a problem with one of the tough syrup that is a brand name is a tino uh, the active one was the dextromethorphan but the active ingredient was uh, mixed up or even replaced with the levo isomer of instead of a dextro so uh, these were the two uh, where the government where the uh, where the officials uh, seriously thought about the restructuring or revamping of our analytical setups and to establish our uh, vibrant uh, pharmacovigilance and regulatory setups as i mentioned that we uh, though we were uh, having our uh, setup basic setup through that uh, we were associate member of who uh, pro program uh, in our pharmacovigilance but uh, after the enactment of uh, drab uh, in 2012 uh, 
uh, where the dedicated section of uh, pharmacovigilance were introduced and uh, through this we established our provincial pharmacovigilance centers in provinces and then uh, through this uh, all the uh, placement or administration uh, we are now the full member of who idm and uh, subsequent to this in the recent past uh, we are now having a dedicated uh, government rules that is provincial pharmacovigilance uh, rules guidelines set up by the draft now these these are the success, success stories where uh, the pharmacovigilance uh, can be can be appreciated again as i mentioned in a serial number 6 and 7 uh, again the same kind of a horrible incidents might be uh, might be took place that one of the product that is a uh, the cardiovascular product and known as nabivolol was supplied is one of our cardiac institutes but the product was contaminated with uh, metronidazole and aloxanide but this time uh, the setup was vibrant and live and our drug testing laboratories uh, caught this uh, sample and uh, not only caught but uh, we identified problem in the formulation and even even at the manufacturing site where the cgmp labs uh, was there we fixed that all these uh, are the examples where the cross contamination uh, caught by our uh, analytical setups now this pv system in pakistan uh, again is being is being uh, operational through its adverse drug reaction monitoring centers uh, where we have a three region centers and uh, more than 150 sub regional centers drug safety informations uh, through its advisories recalls re re uh, newsletters and data submission uh, through our provincial center in the national database through through vigiflow and then who database through vig this uh, national pharmacovigilance center as i mentioned uh, is set up uh, here is uh, with the drug regulatory authority of pakistan and having a statutory empower in this national pharmacovigilance center all the uh, stakeholders including the provincial centers private sectors pharmaceutical industries patient uh, and even public health programs healthcare professionals can uh, uh, can provide any of the information and either through the provincial or direct to the national database as i mentioned that uh, through this uh, provincial setup so drug regulatory authority pakistan uh, have pitched its case in the uh, with the who and now uh, we are the uh, whole member of uh, who of uh, sala monitoring center <clears throat> all these steps i mentioned earlier that the data collection adr assessment entering the database uh, signal detection management and risk quantification and then root cause analysis and risk minimization measures are all in in field uh, in current setups again uh, as much we can uh, uh, all of the reporting channels are uh, are are, are uh, activated and print uh, through through to get the information from any of the sites especially the last that is a med safety mobile app that is introduced by the drug regulatory authority of pakistan where each uh, and every citizen even can can report there any of the problem uh, with the therapeutic goods these are the so far numbers uh, we have in pakistan reported in our uh, vigi flow uh, in the trap that is more than approximate uh, 48000 these include uh, the the ones from the federal side through through its uh, uh, epi and uh, punjab uh, have its role with uh, more than 400 uh, informations and 300 with ict our capital islamabad and uh, 275 plus through your e reporting and mobile app and 14000 from our uh, stakeholder that includes the pharma companies or importers this is the med safety app uh, as i told that uh, introduced by the trap in the recent past and uh, 
through this app, uh, all the healthcare professionals, our health facilities, our regulators, and even the general public can report any of the uh, problem with the therapeutic goods. This is the whole uh, uh, operation where, where, where this uh, uh, pharmacovigilance setup uh, is being operated. This is uh, the the one that is the the chief. Clinical pharmacy and pharmacovigilance officers or drug inspector service in the health facilities. TGRP, that is a therapeutic good related, uh, identified by the provincial uh, officers, pharmacovigilance officers, and report to our provincial center, where as one of the scientific forum uh, may have a deliberation on it. And if required, an immediate action that uh, we may communicate to our uh, field formation head, that is the chief drug controller, and may root the problem. Uh, at any site from uh, either the sampling from the site in order to ascertain the quality parameters in the formulations or if uh, like uh, uh, any of the problem uh, this uh, provincial centers uh, uh, thinks over that uh, requires an immediate uh, measures to be taken at the manufacturing site or the product specific inspections may do the same again uh, either from the uh, drug analysis or from the manufacturing side observations, all are uh, being reported to the uh, scientific forum that is a quality control board and uh, provincial quality control board uh, in the at provincial level and in the district level, the relatively a smaller body that is a district quality control board. And uh, if the district or provincial quality control board thinks that the products may be of uh, uh, require an immediate recall or uh, or if uh, the things that you know, the problem is of a criminal negligence then may send uh, all such cases to the court of law for for appropriate uh, fine or even in imprisonment these are the our, uh, administrative notifications where all of the pharma pharmacovigilance officers uh, uh, were covered uh, to discharge their functions of pharmacovigilance activity these are the notifications and adverse drug reaction reporting system through medicine surveillance system against again this is a, a digital system uh, where all the r for pharmacovigilance officers have the dedicated logins and passwords and if uh, even they think that uh, they may report through a yellow form uh, by any of the healthcare professionals and collection of all of the pb data uh, in our either from the public or private sector at the provincial level. Assessment of these reports and reporting to the National Pharmacovigilance through a VG flow and drug safety alerts, training and awareness session, all those are, all these are the key features and functions of uh, our pharmacovigilance setups. These are the stats we have uh, provincial pharmacovigilance officers uh, across secondary, primary and tertiary healthcare facilities, including the 90 that are with uh, our public sector, private sector hospitals. This is the uh, composition of our provincial pharmacovigilance committee. These are the reporting forms, and these are the reporting national pharmacovigilance. These are the drug safety newsletters and social media channels we have. Uh, uh, this, is, this is the active role of pharmacists in our uh, PB activities, active surveillance, uh, drug drug reaction, medication error, drug utilization review, drug safety information dissemination, collaboration with other healthcare professionals, patient education and awareness programs. All these uh, side activities, uh, including the one at top that is uh, these pharmacists vigilance officers are uh, currently engaged with these uh, kind of uh, healthy activities in their respective uh, healthcare sites. These are the stats of uh, therapeutic good related problems so far reported in our system since 2018. Uh, I'm not taking pride of uh, uh, for against these numbers. I think that uh, in order to get more and more therapeutic related problem, drug safety alerts. We have approximately 2000 uh, newsletters, drug recalls, 
pharmacist work up drug therapy this is the this is important now the, where pharmacist can uh, intervene in any of the patient bedside uh, prescription generated by the clinicians at the patient bed are, are, are around and then uh, any of the pharmacists not only uh, can intervene into the prescription but uh, may incorporate into their uh, alternate suggestions against any of the uh, prescription or combination of product all these pharmacovigilance officers are engaged with the training and awareness session in in their facilities uh, we have so far uh, uh, 12 pharmacovigilance meetings at our provincial level these are the main meetings at alternate days uh, we have a huge uh, so many number of meetings uh, to dis discuss day to day affairs uh, reporting in our system pharmacist work up drug therapy uh, review meetings we have four and then pharmacovigilance uh, cppo trainings meetings uh, we have now the main constraints or challenges uh, we are uh, facing from the last uh, four to five years uh, since the inception of this idea that uh, our dedicated pharmacovigilance uh, setups uh, should be there in health facilities that uh, our staff uh, currently is being deprived from our international exposure trainings and technical uh, staff working in provincial pharmacovigilance centers training and capacity building is the key i think uh, the more and more you spent in our capacity building the more and more you you transmit the same to your to your uh, lower side and and get more and more output in capacity building of the other healthcare professionals including the doctors the staff nurses and other healthcare professionals collaborations with the international drug regulatory bodies including the us fda health canada ema and tga though we have introduced our uh, pharmacy services of pharmacovigilance in our uh, secondary and specialized healthcare but uh, the same need to enhance uh, at our primary level that is a basic health unit rural health centers and in a in a near future upcoming months uh, we have now planned to extend uh, all these kind of activities at our, our basic health facilities pharmacy services and pharmacovigilance uh, setups once uh, established at their the rural health centers and the rsc i think this is this is the uh, this will be the main paradigm shift in the current setups where we will be engaging more and more even general public uh, to enhance our therapeutic good problem now uh, adr reporting what is adr reporting adr reporting depends uh, that how much a culture you establish there culture depends on the active and collaborative relationship between uh, the stakeholders uh, all the stakeholders uh, in fact you, you have uh, more and more uh, collaboration with stakeholders uh, including the uh, ones we are having a business stakes in the system and including the ones where uh, where the two health professions are there so this is the biggest challenge you need to enhance the trust of all the healthcare professionals and your uh, business stakeholders in the system that uh, one should realize that where there is a drug effect there might be the adverse drug, adverse drug effect and this adverse effect um, is not the only of the responsibility of a single but it uh, it should be considered that uh, that the adverse reaction is a part of our action so uh, the culture need to establish i'm thankful to all the uh, participants to all the organizers especially uh, the dr robel uh, dr christine Dr. Fraz, uh, for this uh, healthy session, uh, where we in the, the, in the Pakistan as a uh, Pakistan now representing its uh, the structure and and uh, all the region might have a uh, uh, well understanding and comparative idea their own infrastructure as as they are being operated. Thank you very much. Christine, over to you, please. So thank you very much, Mr. Sohail, for giving a very comprehensive um, overview of the Pakistan healthcare system, particularly those related 
to the National Pharmacovigilance Program in Pakistan, as well as relaying to us the identified roles of pharmacists. Now, we will proceed to our second lecture about the pharmacovigilant system model in Taiwan and the future of pharmacovigilance. So our next speaker, Dr. Wen Wen Chen, is a renowned expert in pharmacy and drug safety. She has a PharmD from the University of Florida and a Bachelor of Pharmacy from the National Taiwan University. Her illustrious career includes roles as Chief Executive Director at the Taiwan Drug Relief Foundation and Drug Safety Associate at the National Taiwan ADR Reporting Center. Dr. Chen has extensive research on drug safety and pharmacovigilance and has been published in reputable journals, making her a respected authority in the field. Please help us warmly welcome Dr. Wen Wen Chen as she imparts her valuable insights in today's webinar. Okay. Can, good afternoon, everyone. Can uh, you hear me well? Yes, Dr. Chen, we can hear you and we can see your presentation. Thank you. Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for the introduction. And um, today I will, uh, I won't, because of the limit of time, so I will not uh, introduce you with the whole picture of Taiwan healthcare system, um, uh, or how I will just focus on how we do pharmacovigilance in Taiwan and uh, the future of pharmacovigilance. So first I'll do my disclaimer. I work for Taiwan Drug Relief Foundation, which operates the Taiwan National ADR Reporting Center. And the view expressed here is mine. Do not necessarily reflect the official opinion of TFDA. And outline, I will first focus on the development of pharmacovigilance in Taiwan and then introduce you with the current scope of pharmacovigilance in Taiwan, and I will focus on management of how we do uh, signal management, and uh, lastly is the future aspect. And first is uh, the development of pharmacovigilance in Taiwan. The pharmacovigilance in Taiwan first started out as a, a research project. It's kind of like a pilot study in 1996. And because of, uh, meantime, because of the Lamiso crisis, the government was forced to uh, uh, react quickly to, uh, re regarding the social demand. So uh, soon after that, uh, the ADR reporting system was established. And in 1998, um, it was entrust the system to operate it uh, under Taiwan Society of Health System Pharmacists and then transferred to our Taiwan Drug Relief Foundation to operate. So the National ADR Reporting System was operated under Taiwan Drug Relief Foundation since, ever since 2003 till now. And in 2004, we do have some um, pharmacovigilance related legislation uh, announced and this legislation in place has pushed the whole pharmacovigilance system to a, a brand new stage, which means that more of uh, reporting and more well structured. Okay, and then um, the National ADR Reporting Center was set up in 2005 and um, after all the passive uh, surveillance structure uh, of pharmacovigilance was kind of well established uh, in 2010, we moved to active surveillance of uh, the pharmaceutical products. And one thing that 
a worth mention is that ADR reporting center was incorporated into hospital accreditation in 2006, which means that um, hospitals or healthcare professionals are forced to pay much more attention to ADR reporting. So that means uh, more reporting from hospital was sending to our national centers. So, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we do have some um, pharmacovigilance as related uh, regulation set up to support our PV policy. And we do have two main uh, legislation in Taiwan uh, related to pharmacovigilance. First one is to regulate reporting of serious adverse drug reaction. And I think Taiwan is one of the very few countries that mandate uh, medical, medical care institutions and pharmacies to report ADR reporting. Uh, so in the regulation, it says medical care institutions, pharmacies, and pharmacal, pharmaceutical company should report all suspected serious adverse reactions. And if failed to do so, um, they shall be imposed with a fine. So um, there is a violation uh, for uh, for that. And in this regulation, we do have uh, uh, the time frame for uh, reporting for both medical institution and pharmacy and pharmaceutical companies uh, for life and threat uh, for death and life threatening uh, ADRs medical care institution they should report it within seven days and follow up report should be sent in within 15 days and for pharmaceutical company they should uh, report all serious adverse events within 15 days however this regulation is in the status of. Did I just. Can you still see my presentation screen now? No, Dr. Chen, it disappeared. Can you reshare your presentation, okay. please? Thank you. I think it just. Okay. Okay. It's okay now. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, for uh, pharmaceutical companies, they should report all serious ADR within 15 calendar days. And for a uh, hospital, they have to report it uh, death and only death and life threatening ADRs within the specific time frame. However, this regulation has has been. Um, under the status of amending. In the future, hospital and pharmacy, they should report all serious ADR within specific time frame, um, which I think will be uh, for not life life threatening and death case, they have to report it within 30 days, 30 calendar days. Okay, the other, um, Pharmacovigilance related uh, regu regulation is for pharmaceutical companies. Uh, Central Health Authority can set up a specific specific period of time for monitoring the safety of licensed product. So the pharmaceutical company they have the responsibility to monitoring the safety of licensed product, and the safety surveillance for pharmaceutical products should cover pharmacovigilance plan, and they have to collect and submission of new drug safety data, which short, for sure that PSUR and summary reports. And if necessary, the health authority can ask the pharmaceutical company to uh, submit the risk assessment and control plan. And what is the current pharmacovigilance system model in Taiwan. Unfortunately, right now, 
um, the ADR reporting center, as I mentioned earlier, it was started out as the research project. Now it's still a contract project uh, contracted by Taiwan TFDA and it was operated under Taiwan Drug Relief Foundation. So the National ADR Reporting Center, uh, we will collect it, we will collect all um, information, safety information, and we will gather all the information and sum up, uh, write up the report and submit it to Taiwan Drug Re Drug FDA, Taiwan TFDA. And once they uh, permit it, we will um, pass on all those. Um, Drug safety information to hospital and healthcare professionals, as well as pharmaceutical companies. And of course, um, hospital and pharmaceutical company, they have to uh, submit their ADR report to ADR reporting centers. And for the scope of pharmacovigilance in Taiwan, um, as you know, Taiwan is a relatively small country with very limited uh, resources. So we kind of relied on global data, global safety data to complement our domestic safety data. So we collect, uh, collect uh, the safety signals from other, other country like um, those safety signal uh, published by uh, other countries' health authority, like like FDA, PMDA, EMA, etc. Um, since we have already have a well well structured pass passive surveillance system, so we add on active surveillance to complement our uh, PV system. So the whole PV process is kind of um, started out with data collection. And we have to collect data, as much safety data as possible. So we mean if no data, no nothing. So we collect as much safety data as possible and try to find needles in a haystack. So once we collect data, um, it's kind of um, not processable. So we have to do in data entry, do data coding, and do some literature review so that those data will be analyzable. And finally, we'll do causality assessment. Next, all those data will be uh, processable and move to signal management process, and then uh, signal mitigation. And today I will focus on uh, how we do signal management uh, in Taiwan. I think it's the key for the whole uh, pharmacovigilance process. This is our uh, uh, process of signal management and we draw up as a flow chart and we publish in uh, pharmacoepidemiology drug safety in 2020. And we can break it down in four steps. First is signal uh, generation, and then safety signal refinement, then move to signal evaluation, and finally risk minimization measures. And in the following slides, I will uh, talk into detail in every single step. First step is uh, signal generation. We gather set we gather safety information from safety news that I mentioned earlier that we monitor global safety news from uh, reg global regulatory bodies and the media. And we uh, collect high alert drug list. We have Taiwan Drug Injury Relief System, which is a very unique system 
that patient can get compensated if they suffer from serious drug reaction. So we have a unique database for that. Um, and as well, uh, high, there, if there is a new drug application, it will be added on to high alert drug list. And most important, uh, we gather information from spontaneous ADR reporting, and we do uh, traditional and quantitative quantitative um, uh, ADR uh, uh, data mining to try to find signal from all those ADR reports. And then, I'm sorry, I'll move I'll fall, uh, back where I got off. And since we have very, very, we have a lot of signals coming through because we collect a lot of data. So the data will be prioritized according to our uh, signal prioritization scheme that was constructed. So all signals will go through a prioritization scheme. We can, uh, we have the five domains to uh, rate uh, all the signals, including the intensity of signal and the existing of evidence and degrees of impact and possibility of further investigation or other special interest. So after uh, the signal prioritization, we will move to the next step. And after the signal was prioritized, the selected signal moved to the second step, signal refinement. And in this step, three types of analysis were conducted, including ADR case series review. We try to do some classification to see if there's similar pattern association. And also we do literature review and lastly as drug utilization study. We do um, drug utilization study by uh, exam the time trend of drug utilization as well as the characteristic of both patient using the drug or the physician prescribing the drug. And um, also the importance of the drug utilization study is to understand local clinical practice that are often very different from those in other countries due to the unique healthcare system in Taiwan and to provide insights to whether further risk minimization measure will be necessary, or which risk minimization measure will be more suitable in Taiwan. And next step is signal evaluation. And based on the refinement, the signal refinement result, we will um, proceed to uh, the next step. According to the signal refinements result, we can, our staff will choose to either continuous monitoring the signal or close the case or report the safety signal to Drug Safety Advisory Committee or we have to do the signal evaluation which is the third step of signal management. Um, for signal evaluation study, is uh, we have to evaluate the absolute, absolute risk, which like uh, instant rate or the, the relative risk, like instance rates ratio or risk factor for adverse events and different um, and in risk evaluation study, we use different pharmacoepidemiology method to uh, do this uh, using real world data to do the risk evaluation studies.
And finally is the step four, risk minimization measures. After um, the Taiwan drug, uh, Taiwan drug, uh, Taiwan, Taiwan FDA received our uh, safety evaluation report, and the Taiwan FDA will hold a drug safety advisory committee. And based on the conclusion, FDA will have the final decision and action in, in response to the safety signal. They can either choose continuous to monitoring the signal, close the case, or do the risk minimization measures. So the risk minimization measure can range from drug safety communication, modification of labeling, and do risk, minim risk management plan, which is RMP, as you know. And in Taiwan, we now call the RMP to, uh, we call its risk assessment and control plan, which is the same, basically, basically the same thing. And finally, um, we also, the regulatory can decide to do the product uh, suspension or withdrawal. And um, what is if the uh, risk RMP is selected for risk minimization measures? We can, after RMP was implemented for several years, we can decide to do a risk minimization evaluation study or not. So the RMM evaluation study is mainly just to see if the RMP is working or not. For instance, if um, the RMP is working, and then we can continue to do the same RMP in the following years. And if the RMP is not working, according to the RMM evaluation study, we can either close the RMP or to do some modification uh, and do the RMM evaluation study again to see if it's working or not. Okay, so um, real world evidence um, for pharmacovigilance in Taiwan. As you, I mentioned earlier, we've used a lot of real world evidence uh, for pharmacovigilance, and we have more than 10 years of experience in using real world evidence in Taiwan. And the real world evidence now has played a crucial role in pharmacovigilance in Taiwan. So, real-world evidence for drugs refers to data and information gathered from real-world settings, such as clinical practice, patient registry, electronic healthcare uh, records, claim database, and other resources outside of control clinical trials. Unlike data from randomized controlled trials, which conducted in controlled environments, real world evidence provide insight into how drugs perform and impact patient in everyday clinical practice. So real world data is aggregate, aggregated and transformed into real world evidence through robust analytics. And real world evidence complement data from clinical trials by providing a more comprehensive understanding of the drug's performance and safety profile and, 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 and safety profiles in a more diverse patient population. It allows, regulate, it allows regulators, healthcare providers, and policymakers to make more informed decisions about drug efficacy, safety, and appropriate use of clinical practice. So that's how important as real world evidence is. And in Taiwan, we do have several um, real world data uh, database. First and more, most in, uh, I will not say the most important, but the most commonly used is National Health Insurance Database. National Health Insurance Database 
are um, government run single payer and as a mandatory healthcare system that cover more than 99% of our population of more than 23 million patients. And it, it is a very, very valuable source of real world data for healthcare research, policy analysis, and medical surveillance. And we do have other uh, real world data like national health database, which includes like cancer registry, uh, disease registry, or um, birth uh, registry, and pregnancy registry, et cetera. And lastly, as the electronic medical records um, that exist in every hospital, now it's more like uh, the red medical records, it's more like electronically exist. However, all these databases are connected in some ex some extent, but not fully connected. So that's the uh, uh, ultimate goal for us to to work on. So, um, how we use real world evidence in pharmacovigilance in Taiwan? Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we use real world evidence throughout the whole process of pharmacovigilance, like the uh, signal management um, process here. We use in the, the here, here, ABC. So, drug utilization study, evaluation study, and risk minimization measure evaluation studies. Real world evidence has is employed to identify potential safety signal by using statistical method methods and data mining techniques on large healthcare database. And these signals are then assessed further to determine their re relevance and possible causal relationship with suspected drug. That's why we have to use real world evidence in uh, the uh, a, the ABC areas. Okay. okay, and we do have uh, used a lot of uh, real world data in pharmacovigilance. So some of the uh, uh, study we have published, some of them are just for national, uh, just report to uh, our central government for their reference. Uh, so this is the uh, type of uh, pharmacovigilance uh, signal management uh, process, like this risk evaluation and risk uh, minimization measure evaluation. This, these are just some example of how we use uh, real world evidence in pharmacovigilance. Finally, uh, future of um, pharmacovigilance in Taiwan, or for all of you. Um, I think uh, pharmacovigilance uh, in the future, uh, we have to uh, integrate real world evidence into our national PV system. Um, even though we have already used real world evidence in our uh, process of pharmacovigilance, we have to do a more organized way or more uh, systemic way to incorporate all these evidence into our routine PV practice. And because real world data possess a large volume of diverse dynamic distributed structure that can potentially identify correlation from information patterns about patient drug, adverse drug reaction, and risk factor within diverse data sets. So that's why we use a lot of 
real world evidence in signal detection, safety surveillance, risk evaluation, and finally, and most important is regulatory decision making process. And uh, for finally future perspective, um, since we have abundant of uh, real world real world data here in Taiwan, we try to use the find the best use of real world data in uh, the whole pharmacovigilance process. And so I think um, real world data is the way to go for pharmacovigilance in the future. So um, multiple data sources are needed. And as I mentioned earlier, um, since some data sets are not well linked, so the linkage be between different sources of real world that evidence need to be strengthened. And in order to do that, a unified um, electronic hospital record has to be done since now um, all the electronic data, electronic health data and hospital cannot be connected or uh, transfer uh, data cannot be transferred. And lastly, stakeholder like pharmacies, pharmacists, healthcare professionals, and health authority are encouraged to utilize big data for drug safety surveillance. Let's all do it together to increase or improve the patient safety. And that's all for my today's presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Dr. Chen, um, now we will proceed with the open forum. Uh, may I request the speakers to please turn on their videos? And also, may I invite our FAPA um, Bureau member, our President-elect, Dr. Yu Li Chang from Taiwan to also represent FAPA in the open forum. So may I call on Dr. Faraz, Dr. Chen, and Mr. Sohail, if he's still around. Thank you very much. Um, we welcome back also our moderator, Dr. Fares, for the open forum. Now, um, we have collected questions for, for this event, um, but I think we have one live question from our chat. So, <clears throat> I think this question is related to our um, second speaker. So, the speaker mentioned about the big data, data mining and the real world data. Uh, I would like to ask whether any artificial intelligence application have been adopted to facilitate adverse event warning or maybe signal detection and which could automatically run to keep track of any sources and provide trustworthy information. Um, is there any? Um, maybe our speaker from Taiwan, Dr. Chen, can answer this question if you have been using this application. Um, okay. Uh, for AI um, application for pharmacovision, unfortunately, in Taiwan, we have not reached that status yet. We are working on that, but um, it's kind of uh, not that easy. So I think uh, for my understanding, uh, USFDA has uh, a project for that. But um, I think AI 
um, in another way need some more resource resources to work on. So right now we're not in the status of using AI application. So um, I don't know if I answered that, that or or not. Thank you very much. Um, I'm sure in the coming years, because the technology is um, rapidly evolving, so probably we'll see more of this and more applications of AI in this area. Um, I, from the registration, we collected some uh, questions also, and I think a lot of our registrants come from the academe as well, not just the hospital and clinical pharmacy. So um, I think um, the pharmacy educators want to know which areas of competency should pharmacists develop in order to contribute to um, improving the pharmacovigilance systems in their countries? So maybe any of our speakers could give some insight here. Um, from um, Just let me know who wants to answer. Okay, I can I, I can answer that first. Okay. Thank you. Okay, for um the experience from Taiwan, I think um for pharmacy pharmacy education, uh the most important is clinical skill. So how well their um uh, their clinical um experience will uh Will decide how much they can contribute. So another thing is, you want if you want to do epi study, then you have to study some pharmacal epi, so that you can um, do some uh, pharm pharmacal epi study and pharmacal vigilance area. Okay. Mm. Thank you very much, Doctor Chen. Uh, Doctor Chang, do you have anything to add in this area? Uh, I, I totally agree with Dr. Chen's idea because the clinical skill is very important to uh, to do the pharmacovigilance. As you know, when you report the ADR, you need to fill all the related clinical data. If you are not familiar with all the uh, patient care process and uh, how to uh, read uh, the medical chart, so you cannot uh, report properly. So it is very important. And also the the pharmacists working with the medical care professionals, especially doctors uh, in Bayside and the clinical area is also very important because they need to familiar with all the related uh, data and they can uh, very exactly and uh, uh, to report specific related relevant information from from the patient. So so the clinical skill is very important for pharmacists. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chang and Dr. Chen. Um, now, if it's okay, I'll proceed with the next question. Um, majority of our participants um, for today come from the hospital and clinical practice. I think many of them um, wants to know how they can incorporate pharmacovigilance more into their day-to-day -day clinical pharmacy practice. And also, um, I think the one of the biggest challenge that is encountered in many um, facilities, I think in other countries as well, is the reporting. And um, especially that uh, this is most of the time voluntary and um, sometimes a lot of hospitals or even the practitioners or professionals are afraid to report due to liability concerns. So this has been raised as a problem that is a challenge for the generating the real world data. So do you have any suggestions to overcome um, the challenges in reporting specifically on um, the liabilities from yes. involved yes. parties? Can I answer this one? Yes, please. Let me see. And you probably. So I'll be, answering this question. I'll be answering this question on behalf of Mr. Muhammad Sahel. 
uh, that clinical pharmacist has two ways of uh, incorporating pharmacovigilance in his practice. The direct way of promoting the pharmacovigilance in the setting is by the capacity building of the other healthcare professionals, the awareness programs of nurses, dispensers, and other allied healthcare professionals, as well as the indirect method can be by adopting the trigger and tracer method in which the clinical pharmacist intervenes, investigate, and see if there are any rescue drugs being used in the patients, that is anti-allergy drugs or steroidal drugs, which are usually used to cater the allergic reactions or ADRs usually arise in the patients. So this is how you can directly and indirectly promote the pharmacovigilance activities in your healthcare settings. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, do you have anything else to add, uh, Dr. Chen? Um, okay, so um, drug adverse drug reaction reporting. Um, in Taiwan, because we have uh, drug relief, uh, drug injury relief uh, system. So if patients suffer from a uh, serious drug reaction, they can apply for uh, the system. So less uh, legally uh, related problem need to be concerned. But on the other hand, for reporting of medical devices, there is a lot of uh, this kind of concern because if they, uh, uh, the reporter will concern if there's a, uh, uh, the, the technique or it's the product pro problems. So, um, uh, I don't think that uh, for ADR reporting here in Taiwan, it will be it it was a concern, but uh, for medical devices, um, a lot of um, education and uh, work need to be done to to conquer this problem. Thank you very much, Dr. Chen. Uh, Dr. Chen, anything else? Uh, I, I believe most hospitals will encourage the healthcare professional to report ADR because, uh, you know, in our hospital accreditation, they will check if your hospital have certain amount of ADR reports. So it is also a way to encourage the healthcare professional in our system to report ADR. And also some hospitals have has provide some reward mechanism. Uh, maybe if you report one ADR, you get some, you know, some reward. So that's the way to encourage the the ADR report. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So I think um, there are two ways to <laughs> improve the reporting. So one is requiring it, and Maybe there's a fine, right? If they do not comply, and then there there's also a incentive if they follow or report, right? So that's a good um, strategy. Um, I think we also have participants who come from government uh, agencies from other countries and um, those who work in public service. So I think um, one area of concern is risk communication. And I think I believe um, with the recent um, situation brought about public health emergencies like COVID, and then we encountered a lot of issues regarding vaccines or medicines. And then one commonly encountered problem is how we communicate the risks to the public and how we engage with media in terms of these kinds of information. I'm sure many of us are um, familiar with this problem. Now, I would like to get your insights on what you think are the best ways of managing um, these concerns, especially risk communication. Mm -hmm. 
Anyone who wants to answer, can me do so. With regards to such incidents in which there is any pandemic or epidemic situation occurring, uh, the public sectors, uh, especially Punjab, have uh, taken up expanded immunization programs help and uh, adverse effect event reporting system installed in all the facilities, be it the primary, second year tertiary, that wherever this in this uh, vaccine or this drug is being installed in any patient, they are being actively monitored and the staff as well as being highly sensitized to monitor the patients for any area being occurred and is rightly being reported manually or by the ID support to the central department and is being given to the higher authorities like DRAP and WHO. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Chen. I think this is a very hard question because risk communication is it's always not easy. Um, for us, uh, I think the government do the risk communication most of the time, um, as um, uh, as a ADR reporting center, we just provide all the safety uh, information and gather all the information for them to to make the final decision, and they communicate with the public. So, um, how when is the best best time to communicate? Or uh, it it's there's no gold standard. So. Um, um it's um we as a hard uh topic that we have to work on so i think dr chan has something to add <laughs> yeah for, for uh i think uh, in in taiwan uh, especially during the covid period the the government play a very important role and play a proactive role because the 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 commander of CDC uh, and the, the the government officer they appear in the TV every day. They you know they 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 communicate with the public directly every day. So every day they uh, in the same time every day in afternoon uh, two o'clock there is a uh, 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 re report. Uh, th there is a, a, a broadcasting uh, program every day, so so they can communicate very frequently, and uh, they can explain all the misinformation quickly. Yeah, so I think it's a good way to communicate and uh, uh, to avoid many uh, misleading or misunderstanding about the the issue about the ADR of vaccine. Yeah, it's, it's Taiwan's experience. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Chang and our speakers. I think um, I think pharmacists are really involved from, from the start, from collecting the data up to the communication part, right? So we really have to be aware on the competencies up to the skills on how we can communicate and also need to have the updated information um, that we need to communicate to the public to prevent um, misinformation and also the challenges of you know ensuring that patients comply and uh, follow their um, medications okay so i think um because, uh, for the interest of time that's the only questions that we can answer for now. And I think from this event, we will be coming up with an article to summarize uh, the discussions and also some resources that we can share with the public. So it will be available in the FAPA website as well as this recording. Um, if it's okay, can we now proceed to the closing remarks? Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.
So for our closing remarks and to give the synthesis of our um, webinar for today, may we call on Dr. Yuli Chang, our FAPA president-elect. Thank you, Chris Christine. <laughs> our, our distinguished speaker, uh, Dr. Sohel and Dr. Chen, Section Chair, Dr. Faraz, Secretary General, Christine, ladies and gentlemen, as we come to the end of the symposium on behalf of the organizing committee, I'd like to express my sincere gratitude to our distinguished speakers and uh, uh, for your excellent presentations. Also, thanks to all the participants who contribute to the success of this event. As a professional pharmacist, we should under stand the main task of pharmacists in drug pharmacovigilance, especially for hospital and the community pharmacists. We are on the front line facing patients. Our responsibility is significant. We pharmacists play a crucial role in actively monitoring and identifying any adverse reactions and reporting ADRs. In today's speech, Director Sohel has presented the government consideration and the policies and the share the value, valuable experience in Pakistan. Dr. Chen from Taiwan provided us the whole picture of pharmacovigilance in Taiwan and how they utilize the real world data to support decision making and the improve drug safety and uh, effectiveness. Uh, I am confident that the insight and the invaluable knowledge shared during this symposium will help us to better understand the, the past and the future of pharmacovigilance and uh, inspire the audience to improve pharmacovigilance in your region and countries. Meanwhile, I would like to take this opportunity to introduce to all of you again that the 2023 FAPA conference will be held in Taipei. Taiwan from, uh, from October 24 to 28 this year. The theme of the conference is health system resilience, security and the equity. The FAPA conference cover various major topics, including all specialties in the practice areas. For this year's special event, beside the welcome reception and gala dinner, we have planned a free visit tour to three medical centers and two pharmaceutical companies. The whole conference promised to be exciting and enriching. FAPA members come from 24 countries and the the Congress will be the grand, greatest pharmaceutical conference event in Asia. I sincerely invite all of you to participate this year's FAPA Congress. Thank you again to everyone who participated in this symposium, and I look forward to seeing you again in the near future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Chang. And I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge all our speakers and the organizers behind this event, especially um, Pakistan Pharmacists Association, Federation of Taiwan Pharmacists Association. Um, special mention to um, Taipei Veterans General Hospital and also the FAPA headquarters and our volunteers. Thank you very much. And to all our participants from the 20 countries and more uh, who join us live and who will be listening to this um, webinar, thank you very much for your contribution. And we look forward to seeing you in Taipei during the FAPA Congress. Thank you very much.